I'm seeing things in my head like little sparks firing off and it's not until the very last moment that those sparks tell me what, what on earth they mean. I've never encountered anyone like this. He absolutely blew my mind. To scientists, this man is a gold mine, a once in a lifetime opportunity. This could be the linchpin that spawns off a new field of research. Why are they all so excited? Genius. It's not human. <laughs>
with a dazzling memory stunt. The ambition is to remember pi to 22,500 decimal places and to recite it in a live environment with invigilators who will be checking and uh, making sure obviously that uh, the recitation is correct from start to finish. Pi is the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. It's a number with no pattern that seems to be infinite. Daniel reckoned he could reel off the first 22 and a half thousand decimal places without a mistake. One, four, one, five, nine, two, six, five, three, five, eight, two, zero, nine, seven, four, nine, four, four, two, three, six, four, eight, zero, eight, eight, one, zero, nine, two, five, nine, zero, three, four, six, nine, zero, eight, five, seven, seven, eight, zero, six, nine, nine, five, five, seven, one. Two hours later, and Daniel is barely halfway. Absolutely staggering. Uh, it's a, beautiful to listen to the, the flow of numbers. It's beautiful to see the concentration. It's always amazing to be in front of one of the world's extraordinary persons. After five hours and nine minutes, Daniel is nearing the finish line. His recall has been flawless. Finished. Yeah. It's gobsmackingly brilliant. Brilliant, yes. But does this mean that Daniel could also have learned by heart thousands of different calculations? Or does he, as he claims, have some strange power to see the answers in his head? His childhood holds a dramatic clue. One of nine children brought up in East London Daniel claims that he's been able to do massive calculations since he was only four. I had um, quite a uh, severe seizure as a very small child. A series of seizures and a diagnosis of, of epilepsy was made. His childhood fits seem to have changed something in his brain. It's really from that time that I started to, to see pictures in my mind, images started to, to form. Intuitively, Daniel also began to perceive the patterns within numbers. Cases like this are extremely rare, yet there are others who have also suffered injury to the brain, only to emerge with a startling and often similar kind of talent. Orlando Serrell was just 10 when he received his fateful blow. Me and a couple of friends were playing baseball. I was a batter. I ran to first base, they got through the ball, and the ball hit me on my left side of the head. It was a hard hit, right up in this area, right up in there. And I just laid on the ground. I didn't go to the hospital, didn't get no treatment or nothing. To his surprise, Orlando soon discovered that he could name the day of the week and recall the weather for any date since his accident. February 17th, 1980 is on a Sunday. It was sunshine and clear skies. June 3rd, 1985 was on a Monday. It was hot. March 28th, 1990 is on a Wednesday. Oh, sunshine and clear skies. On Sunday it was January hot. 2nd, 85 was on a Wednesday. December 23rd, 1992 was on a Wednesday. December 24th, 89 is on a Sunday. Cloudy. I can't explain it. It just pops right into my head. Somehow, the circuitry in his brain is computing calendar dates. What part of my brain is doing this, I don't know. Both Orlando and Daniel seem to possess special powers of perception, as well as enhanced memory. There are only a handful of people like this worldwide, 
and they are known to science as savants. The concept was popularized by the hit movie Rain Man, where actor Dustin Hoffman plays the part of a brilliantly gifted misfit. Like Rain Man, most savants lack normal social skills, often because they're autistic. In fact, the link with autism is so strong that we wondered whether it could be a factor in Daniel's abilities. Cambridge neuroscientist Professor Simon Baron Cohen, an expert on autism, will be making a careful assessment. Autism is a spectrum of medical conditions where people have a lot of difficulty in forming social relationships and in putting themselves into other people's shoes to imagine other people's thoughts and feelings. But it's also where the individual develops very strong, narrow interests, obsessions, and likes to do things in a very repetitive way. So it's a mix of ability and disability. 25-year-old Daniel seems to have lots of ability, yet no obvious disability. Today he's joined by his mother, who will help to reconstruct Daniel's childhood. Amongst your other children, are any of them also... Her memories, it turns out, are still vivid. If you had Daniel as a first child, you would never have another child because the constant crying... <laughs> up until ne nearly the age of two, he was right. a real handful. He would just cry. Constantly. We took to even swinging him in a, a blanket. His dad would be at one end of the blanket, I would have the other, and we, we resorted to that out mm. of desperation. Did you like that? Yes, that soothed him. Did you like the sort of repetitive movements? Yes, yes, right. that soothed him. The repetition seemed to soothe him, and that's again a very sort of classic autistic characteristic. I mean, if you... If you think back to the days when he was at primary school, were the, were the teachers at all um, concerned about him or did they talk about him as if he was different in some way? You know, what would happen during break time? I think I would count stones, I remember counting stones. And also there was a, is it called hopscotch? Yeah. So I would count the numbers on the mm. hopscotch. This was what interested me, and so this is what I would do, and nothing right. else mattered. I knew he didn't integrate that well. I do remember you walking around the playground and looking at, up at the trees. I'd walk around the trees and uh, look at the leaves, look at the patterns on the, right. the leaves and the bark. It seems to have the complexity within yeah. its shapes and yeah, textures absolutely. that reminds me of yeah. numbers. Right. Numbers, for me, have always been it's like the, the most real thing for me. From the time I was about five, I've almost looked through numbers. Numbers have been my lens, the way that I've looked at the world around me. So I'll always count things. So I'll look at something and say, that looks like... 131, for example, or that looks like 52. And just always thinking that this is how everyone else experiences numbers, you know, that, that this is a normal thing. He got most pleasure out of just taking the maths books home and lying on his bedroom floor alone, going as far as he could with uh, numerical problems and just understanding numbers feeling much more comfortable in a world of, of numbers than people. Daniel's obsession with maths is at least part of the explanation for his special ability with numbers. The things that he always felt were his friends. Because I was so different, mm -hmm. the children who would be bullies didn't know what to do with me, you know, they didn't know how to teach me, so they just let me be pretty much. By most measures, Daniel is autistic but he's also picked up enough social skills to blend in. The one criterion that really is missing to warrant a diagnosis is that his symptoms are not really interfering currently with his life. For whatever reason, he's managed to, uh, to adapt to our world. 
Daniel is lucky. Rare abilities like his usually come with severe mental handicap as part of the price. Dane Bertino is a savant too. They're very different from Daniel. Oh, you love it. For one thing, his gift is not for maths. We knew by two and a half uh, that Dane wasn't talking, but instead he was just expressing himself through art. He was drawing night and day. Since he was a toddler, Dane has been able to draw with extraordinary precision. But there's always been a flip side to his talent. <laughs> What do you want to do? <laughs> Dane's language and social skills remain childlike, even as his art becomes richer. He really pays attention to the little minute details, but he would put the emotion in. He loves drawing in the sand and he enjoys watching the waves come in and wash it away and then draw something else because he draws really quickly. So he likes to see things um, uh, change so that he can draw something new. How is this remarkable boy seeing the world? It would be fascinating to know if only he could tell us. What makes Daniel different from savants like Dane and so extremely valuable to science is that he can describe what's going on inside his head. I experience numbers in a very visual way, using colors, texture, shape and form, sequences of numbers, form, landscapes in my mind. It just happens. It's like having a fourth dimension. One, for example, would be very bright, very bright and shiny number. It's almost like somebody flashing a light in my face, you know, it's a very, it's a very interesting experience. Number two is kind of like a movement, right to left, kind of like a drifting motion. Five is like the clap of thunder or the sound of a wave against the rock. Six is very small, it's actually the number I find hardest to experience in any sort of meaningful visual way so it's it's often the absence of anything it's like a hole or a, or a chasm or like a black hole number nine is the biggest number it's very tall it can be intimidating daniel says he sees every number up to ten thousand as a distinct shape or image until recently many researchers would have dismissed this as mumbo jumbo but there is now a sound, scientific explanation. Different parts of our brain are specialized for different tasks. Juggling numbers, for example, or seeing shapes. If cross-activation occurs between areas that are normally separate, then things can get very mixed up. You might hear a sound and see a color, or think a number and feel emotion. Scientists call this weird phenomenon synesthesia, Sort of Julian Asher, a researcher at Cambridge University, experiences synesthesia himself, but is struck by how peculiar it is in Daniel. For most synesthetes, what they see is much more abstract. For instance, I see what almost might be colored flames, this sort of a flickering, flowing movement. But Daniel sees very concrete shapes, which is quite unusual. Is the entire number drifting upwards? Or yes. Is it, uh... Mm -hmm. Julian believes that Daniel's complex imagery is the key to his gigantic memory. When he's recalling a number to 22,500 digits, what he's doing is moving mentally through a synesthetic landscape and effectively reading the numbers from the landscape. But are Daniel's number shapes also the key to his maths ability? To find out more, we're sending him to San Diego's Center for Brain Studies in California where he'll be grilled by skeptical scientists. First, though, he'll be traveling across America and putting some of his mental powers to the test. Mm -hmm. 
Daniel is in New York, but not as we know it. For someone who reads numbers into everything, the city is giving him a strange vibe. Being in New York with all these huge skyscrapers, it's uh, intimidating for me, and all the time I had the sensation that I'm being surrounded by nines, the number nine is all around me. It can be a very nerve-wracking experience. Seeing objects as numbers is something Daniel has grown up with. It can be a little distracting, but it's also something he can use to his advantage. Daniel is going to meet the chess hustlers, but he won't be playing chess. Instead, he'll propose a memory game. I'm Daniel. He wants five minutes to memorize a board with 26 randomly placed pieces. And he's offering 10 bucks for every mistake he makes. <laughs> it's an offer they can't refuse. So I was first having to imagine that it wasn't a chessboard, but a sequence of numbers. And then I was experiencing the numbers as imagery. <laughs> Time's up, and the heat is on. They scrutinize Daniel's positions, trying to find fault. I pretty much got it spot on. I think there was one piece I didn't put on the board. That's pretty good for being a nine chess player. And now for the hustle. Do you mind if we take the pieces off and test one of you two guys? Because you, you're pretty good well, chess well, players. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with you. I, I don't know if I can top you. Would one of you. Maybe my friend would like to do it, but I don't know if I can. Uh, honestly, I don't know. We if can, can give you as much. We can give you an extra few minutes if you really want to study. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's The other guy, the chess hustler, I take my hat off to him, he was game, he went for it, he did it. I was actually impressed, personally speaking. He did better than I thought he would do. F5. I think he made nine mistakes. For me, that's amazing. All the pieces that you remembered, you remembered in the right order. If he's not experiencing the pieces in any distinctive way, and yet he's able to do that, it shows that raw memory is really good. If you're talking memory, though, there's one man who's in a league of his own. He's the world's most famous savant, and Daniel's next stop en route to California. Daniel's next stop is the one he's been savoring. A meeting with the real Rain Man. I'm looking forward to meeting Kim Peek because he's meant to be amazing. He was the guy that the Rain Man character was based on. This is really exciting for me because it's my first time meeting someone else with whom I, I have this bond. Daniel makes his way to Salt Lake City's pub him and his father are waiting for him. Hello, it's nice to meet you too. Let's walk down in here and we can have a show. They head off to a quiet corner where Daniel can find out more about Kim's stupendous memory. With total photographic memory, he remembers everything he's ever read. 
He can tell you the uh, every city in the United States, its highways and its area codes and its zip codes and its television stations and its counties and when it was made a state. The history of any country, all the rulers and when they served, presidents of this country when they were born, their wives, their families, uh, all of NASA's accomplishments, uh, when they went up, when they came down, what they're doing. He can talk to you about the Bible, he can quote scriptures, he can tell you anything about it you want to ask him about. It seems like everything he reads, uh, he maintains. At nine months, the uh, neuropsychiatrist said he's uh, severely mentally retarded. Uh, he will uh, never be able to learn. You should uh, put him in an institution, forget about him. But Kim was reading encyclopedias by age four and had finished the high school curriculum by 14. Goodbye, old pain. I'm a-leaving Cheyenne. You know that? How fast can he read? He reads a page that you and I would read in, in three minutes, approximately. It takes him about eight to 10 seconds. He reads the left page, the left eye, right page, the right eye, and uh, remembers about 98% of it. Go back through here. Mm -hmm. Kim, my birth date is January 31st, 1979. It was a, it was a, it was a Wednesday, it was a Wednesday, and this year it's a, a Saturday, we turn 2044 on a Sunday. What year did Queen Victoria become Queen? 1837 to 1901. Kim, if uh, Winston Churchill was alive today, how old would he be? 130. And what day of the week would his birthday fall on this year? It would be on a Tuesday, the last day of November. In 1987, Kim met actor Dustin Hoffman and became the inspiration for the hit movie, Rain Man. We went to Hollywood the next morning and Kim spent the day with Dustin and uh, all of his film friends. And it, was, it was amazing, all the things they asked him and all the things he knew. Uh, it was just like I hadn't known him before. There were so many new things that came out of him. Although I'm much older, mm -hmm. you're still a, a fine man. Thank you. So are you. Yes, sir. And he says you don't have to be handicapped to be different, because everybody's different. Yeah. There are all sorts of associations bubbling over in his mind. No wonder you look like Mary Ruth Haslam. It was almost as if he had too much information and he couldn't get it out quickly enough. His parting words to me were, we looked into each other's eyes and he said, um, one day you'll be as great as I am. And that was a wonderful compliment and uh, what an aspiration to have. Before he encounters the scientists, Daniel is making one last stop. Inspired by Rain Man, he's in Las Vegas to see if he can use his amazing memory to beat the house. For someone who hates crowds and flashing lights, it's an unsettling kind of place. I haven't actually been in a casino before. I play cards with friends sometimes. They don't like playing with me. In blackjack, the dealer has the advantage. And even for a card counter, it still comes down to chance. It was actually really hard to concentrate because the bright lights, the noise, the atmosphere, a strange mixture of tension and excitement, all in one. Daniel is playing two rounds with eight decks each. That's over 400 cards to keep track of at once. Round one is a disaster. Daniel's chips are disappearing fast. And memory alone just isn't giving him an edge. Eventually, he changes strategy and follows his instincts. At the end, I was just relying on intuition and the imagery as it flowed into my mind. At the most unpromising moment, Daniel decides to gamble. The house had a 10, which is a regular card. 
and I was given two sevens, and that's not a good hand, and it's particularly not a good hand against a ten. What I decided to do was split the sevens, an unusual move, statistically speaking, not the best move, but something in my head was telling me to do that anyway because of the imagery that I was experiencing, and so I split the sevens, doubled my bet, was given a third card, and it also turned out to be a seven. And at this stage, I wasn't really sure of the rules of the game because this is the first time I've played blackjack in a casino. So I asked, can I split those two? And she's surprised, but she says, sure, if you want to. So she splits those. And so I now have three hands at one time against the ten. And the people behind me are tutting and they're, you know, they're saying, what, what is he doing? You know, he's, so, he's playing three hands against the ten. He's splitting seven against the ten. He's crazy. And then she draws the remaining cards for each seven. He hits 21 on his first hand. And again on his second. That's two out of two. Who'd bet against a hat-trick now? <laughs> his sixth sense proves a winner. And in one fell swoop, Daniel squares his losses. How did you get that? I don't care if I lose now, that was fantastic. But Daniel needs to stay sharp as he heads for California and the showdown that really counts. At San Diego's Center for Brain Studies, he's about to face a series of tests. Does he really have some kind of sixth sense, an ability with numbers that goes beyond just memory? Neuroscientist Professor Ramachandran and his team are intrigued by the idea, but have their doubts. When Rama first came to me and said, hey, we've got this math savant that's coming here, and he can do four by four multiplication, and he can recognize primes, and he can do uh, division out to so many decimal places, I thought, yeah, 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 he's probably faking it, or he's got it memorized. You know, there's all sorts of techniques, and I'm very much a big skeptic of this. With the pleasantries over, the testing can begin. 27 to the power of six. six. Oh, can you do it to the power of seven? Yes, okay. Uh, one, zero, four, six, zero, three, five, three, two, zero, three. That's Excellent. Be better than the calculator. I, I need to see whether or not that zero, three is correct, but you know, I have a feeling it would be. 31 to the power of 6. Jet lag is wrecking his concentration and slowing him up. Seven, five, zero, three, six, eight, one. Spectacular. Daniel has certainly impressed the scientists with his ability to calculate, but they're keeping an open mind about his method. Okay, here we are confronted with somebody who claims to have amazing computational skills, and when we tested him with some simple numbers, doing a number, a two-digit two -digit number like 37 to the power of seven, uh, very, very quickly he gave us the accurate answer. And we did this with several different numbers. The question is, how is he doing it? One possibility is that Daniel has trained himself to do super-fast calculations in his head. As we're about to see, the human brain can do incredible things. Believe it or not, an extraordinary maths ability like Daniel's is something that ordinary people can learn. Here in Tokyo, some schools still teach the ancient art of the abacus. Children start learning the basic skills aged four and practice every day. By the time they're 12, these whiz kids are fast becoming human calculators. 
To be sure, lessons are not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> well, I'm sometimes bear strict, so some child cries, perhaps, or sometimes I hit them. But they keep coming here. I hope they are happy. But when they are training, they never have a smile on their faces. Nevertheless, eight years of hard slog can produce jaw-dropping results. Twelve-year-old Kota Kizuka is top of the class. I practice two hours on weekdays and ten hours on the weekend. I want to become the national champion. Along with the other high flyers, he can now do huge calculations with a purely imaginary abacus, manipulating nothing but thin air. Children like this show us that with enough practice, super fast mental calculation is possible. Hi. Hi. Come here, mate. Yet Daniel insists he's not doing this kind of conscious calculation at all. He says the answers come to him spontaneously out of his mental imagery. Rama and his team are finding it hard to trip Daniel up, but they're not finished with him yet. If Daniel's descriptions of his numbers are real. Then they should also be consistent. Rama asks Daniel to model some of his numbers with Play-Doh, but doesn't tell him that he'll be retested the next day. It's hard to imagine him having memorized shapes. The question is, are they the same shape? So we can actually compare that now. That's two four two. Now let's see his two four two today. Overall, there's a remarkable similarity. That's very interesting. Let's take.、Um, Fifty-eight. Again, same story. Very similar. Same color. Same shape. But not exactly the same. Eight hundred and ten from today. Eight hundred and ten from yesterday. And again, it's a very precise shape. So the general impression is he seems to be producing the same shapes consistently. Daniel has cruised the consistency test, but Rama and his team are still dubious that Daniel reacts emotionally to certain numbers. I was a little bit mean, and I played a trick on Daniel. He, he said he loved pie because it was beautiful. It was just this wonderful, special shape. Well, if it's so beautiful for him, and he normally gets this wonderful, warm reaction from pie, I thought that I would show him something that. Initially, would look like pi on the surface, three point one four, and tweak it a little bit. Throw in numbers like six, which he doesn't like. The small electrodes attached to Daniel's fingers are like a lie detector. They'll measure any emotional response, good or bad. So, if Daniel is shown a number that he really loves, there should be a clear-cut signal. So, sure enough, I showed him this. Bastardized version of pi, and we saw this very nice, you know, warm galvanic skin response, and then all, and it, it jumped up, and then all of a sudden it jumped again. And as he was scanning it, we kept getting another jolt and another jolt and another jolt, and it, it, it wouldn't stop. And afterwards, I was asking him,、well, "What's going on in your head when you were seeing that?" And he said, "Well, you know, here's this beautiful number pi that I love, and I see it, and then as I'm looking at the landscape, all of a sudden there's a pit where it's not supposed to be, and you know this mountain is missing, and and it's really it's it's wrong, and how could you do that to something so beautiful? And and you know while it was a little bit mean to do that to him, it really shows the point that he." Does have some sense of emotion associated with these numbers because the the skin response was off the charts. It was something you just can't fake. These are the things, specifically, that are showing me he's not bullshitting and he's not scamming. Even the mistakes that Daniel is making are the mistakes that tell me, you know what, this this is this is legit. A faker wouldn't be doing this. So, if Daniel is for real, how is he able to do such huge calculations without any conscious effort? When you did this computation in your head, what exactly was going on in your head? What were you doing? I see an image in my head, and 
that image starts to change, it starts to almost like evolve. It's quite vague at first. As I'm looking at it, it becomes clearer and clearer over a time and then from, from that landscape I can read the digits out. So it sort of gradually crystallizes? Yes. In a multiplication, the two numbers hover before him as distinct shapes. The gap in between makes a third shape, which Daniel experiences as a new number, the correct answer. He's doing math, but he doesn't even know it. When it comes to numbers, it seems that Daniel's brain really is doing something extraordinary. I'm blown away. Something the scientists can't yet get a handle on. This could be the linchpin that spawns off a new field of research. But we still had one last test for Daniel. Daniel is now flying to Iceland for his ultimate challenge. We've given him a week to learn a totally new language from scratch and then go live on national television. Even the locals say that Icelandic is confusing and unpronounceable. The difficult bit is the grammar, I would say. But we have funny sounds where you have nowhere in the world that like, you do like a sound like this. With the clock ticking, Daniel badly needs some lessons. But his teacher doesn't seem hopeful. There is a myth that it's impossible to learn Icelandic. So the foreigners that I get to teach, they have this feeling. It's like, you would say, impossible. Impossible for, for, for a human <laughs> to learn this in a week. Just omulegt. That's the Icelandic word for impossible. In a colloquial speak, if a native speaker speaking. Daniel's brain power may have met its limits. First, when you get into a new language, it's like a bus. You just, that's what you hear. You don't hear words, you just hear And for the ear, it takes time to adjust and tune in and trying to find the sounds. It's one thing to learn the language, to speak it, to be able to produce it, to actually, you know, talk with somebody. Comprehension, actually listening to the language and understanding it. That's, that's something else because it takes time for the ear to actually get used to the totally different sounds. With a day to go before Daniel's live chat show, his teacher's early doubts are turning to amazement. He was like a vacuum cleaner, I can see. He was sucking up the words and he was just putting it in his brain. Little by little, hour by hour, I'm just beginning to tune in and hear more and more of the language and understand more and more of it. It's one thing to chat with your teacher. Speaking live to a quarter of a million people is the real test. I have no idea what will come out uh, tomorrow night. If you get too stressed, nothing is going to come out. The seven days are up and Daniel is making last-minute preparations before he goes live on air. Uh, Islensk er fyrir mig í, uh, svo fallig og <laughs> já er fyrir að læra um, á sjó dögum <laughs> uh, þegar ég sé Islendinga dala á Islensku er uh, svo oitfert uh, eins og anda og ég er með Islensku asma <laughs> <laughs> How well has Daniel managed to speak Icelandic after just a week of learning the language from scratch? Astonishingly, it looks like Daniel has pulled it off. I was amazed. He was responding to our questions. He did understand them very well. And uh, I thought he, that his grammar was very good. We are very proud of our language and then that someone is able to speak it after only one week. 
That's just great. Okay, Frauper. So Daniel is, is definitely unique. I, I would say him as a genius. And for me, I will never ever get in touch with a person or a student as gifted as he is because it's almost beyond. It, it's 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 not human. There's no doubt that abilities like Daniel's are extremely rare. World authority on savants, Dr. Daryl Treffert, has spent a lifetime studying the Rain Man phenomenon and is in no doubt where to rank Daniel. My estimate is there are probably fewer than 50 such people living worldwide. I think Daniel's ability is at a prodigious level because it would be spectacular. If that were to be seen in any of us, it would be spectacular. Equally, though, Daniel has been blessed with almost miraculous good fortune. The line between profound talent and profound disability seems really and surprisingly thin one. The way Daniel can describe his inner world is giving scientists a window into the brain that they've never had. But the truth is, their journey of exploration is only just beginning. The bigger question is whether we all have some of those abilities within us, and that is what I refer to as the little rain man within each of us. What I do, it isn't, I don't think it's supernatural, I don't think it's something that can't be explained. Who knows, there may be abilities here that everyone can perhaps tap into in some way. Savant Syndrome is challenging us to think in new ways about intelligence and what intelligence is.